It's wonderful to be back. Uh, truth, truth to be told, when Stan asks me to come, my immediate thought is really not, not you or Stan, but it's the dinner. Uh, on Friday night, the, the ritual dinner, uh, I won't tell you anything about it, it won't do you any good, it won't sanctify you to know what we do on these occasions. And, um, but it's, um, my wife says uh, hello, she wasn't able to come with me this time, and she's been with me in the past and uh, spent some time, uh, extra time in Ashland, Ashfield, Ashland, Ashland, and uh, Crater Lake, I remember, uh, a, I remember thinking, visiting Crater Lake, that uh, there was so much snow we wouldn't actually be able to get out again. Uh, we, have, um, we have a lot of material to cover today. And uh, so much material that I, I've, I've kind of summarized it all onto a page uh, in, um, in my handwritten scribble, uh, just to try and uh, keep everything together. Um, covenant theology. Uh, this is, uh, covenant theology is like a key. I was, I was going to bring one out, but I, it's in my bag. Uh, it's like a key, like a door key, like a car key. Uh, it's a key that unlocks the Scriptures. H how do you read the Bible? How do you read continuously from Genesis through to Malachi, and then that blank page and into Matthew? and keep on going to Revelation. How do you do that? How do you understand the relationship? What's that blank page all about? Have you, have you crossed the kind of Rubicon when you go from Malachi to Matthew that there was a before and now there's an after? But what, what is the relationship between, between the old covenant and the new covenant? Uh, covenant theology divides Christians, divides churches, divides denominations. Probably the biggest division uh, that I can think of with covenant theology is um, something like dispensationalism. Uh, the, the Schofield Bible, the Ryrie Study Bible, uh, or progressive dispensationalism. Not the old style with, with, with seven different economies, uh, seven different dispensations. The church is a kind of parenthesis, a kind of plan B, but the main plan is plan A, and that's Israel. Uh, covenant theology is on the, is on the polar extreme to, to that. Uh, but today, we've got something a little more progressive. Uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, for example, uh, Bibliotheca Sacra, the, the journal that comes out of, uh, of Dallas uh, Theological Seminary. And today, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of them are more sort of progressive, not sort of seven dispensations, but perhaps two and a half or something like that. And it's, it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly where they are. And I won't mention any names, uh, but some of the great scholars uh, and writers and authors of today, uh, I, would, I would label them as progressive um, dispensationalists. There's still a dispensation. There's still Israel versus the church. That would be the main principal division. Uh, let me, uh, I need to get into this material somewhere, and I'm circling the wagons here, but I, and I really do need to get in and start, because uh, we've got a lot of stuff to do, but I'm trying, just trying to give you a big picture. So let me, let me say one more thing, and then we're going to go inside. Uh, the 17th century, uh, the period of the great confessions of faith following the Reformation in the 16th century, uh, I'm thinking of the Westminster Confession in, the, in 1645. I'm thinking of the Belgic Confession a little earlier. Uh, I'm thinking of the 1689 Baptist Confession, for example, or the Savoy Declaration of the um, Congregationalists, uh, John and Owen and, 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 that, and those folk. Uh, all of them, all those great confessions of the 17th century, adopted covenant theology. Uh, so, the Westminster Confession adopts covenant theology as the hermeneutical key, the, the principle of interpretation 
of Scripture? How do you interpret the Bible? Now, some, some of you may already be a little uh, defensive. Um, I, I'm not singling anybody out. You, I, I'm not assuming anything about anybody who's here today. Uh, I, I, need a, I need a sort of adversary in order to make this thing work. So I have an imaginary, I have an imaginary a- adversary, and if I kind of look at you and I'm saying this, don't take it personally, I, I know nothing about you. Um, but it helps me to, to put something in perspective by having, having a, a, a stake in the ground as to how it is covenant theology is, is different from this. Uh, and um, uh, the 17th century uh, divines, uh, Westminster Confession as an example, uh, took covenant theology as, uh, as the key by which to interpret the whole of Scripture. And some, some get a little defensive about that because that's like uh, imposing a grid on Scripture rather than letting Scripture speak for itself. Uh, more deductive than inductive. Uh, and uh, so, some folk, uh, uh, so aware of that, what, what, I'm, what I'm actually going to do is now the opposite. I'm going to go inductively, kind of, sort of. There's, there's, always, there's always hidden presuppositions in everything that we do. And, and, uh, but we're going to walk through the Bible. Uh, so you, you actually need a Bible today because I'm, I'm actually going to walk through it, uh, and I'm going to go, uh, and we're going to look at the covenant of works uh, in the Garden of Eden, or the, the covenant of creation, or the covenant of life, uh, however, however you want to call that, and traditionally it's been called the covenant of works. We're going to skip over the Noahic covenant, covenant with Noah, simply because of time. Uh, and I'm going to go to Abraham, and we're going to look at Genesis 12, 15, and 17, and the covenant with Abraham. Then we're going to skip over to Moses, uh, and, and the covenant with Moses, and, and particularly the, the huge issue, an issue that the Bible itself, the New Testament itself, raises, what place does the law have in, in the covenant with Moses? And that's uh, if, if that doesn't ring bells, uh, you're not awake, and, and I don't know what world you're living in, uh, but that's, that's the key issue that people are talking about right now because they've always been talking about it uh, ever, since, uh, ever since Sinai, they've been talking about it. Uh, and then we're going to go and look at, uh, we're going to skip over the covenant with David. Uh, we'll sort of mention it in passing, and then I want to look at uh, the Old Testament prophecies with regard to the new covenant and ask what is the new covenant and how is the new covenant related to the old covenant? Is it different? Is it the same? Is it just more? Uh, and so on. And then tomorrow morning, uh, I'm going to come all the way down into a passage in the New Testament as a, as a sermon that, that con- condenses all of what we're, we're doing uh, from Galatians. Not quite decided which passage yet. But but uh, we're going to look at uh, a passage of Scripture that actually addresses the whole issue of covenant theology, in particu- and in particular, the relationship between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So that's what we're going to try and do uh, in uh, the space of time that we have. So thinking caps on, Bible's ready, uh, uh, here we go, uh, and start in Genesis. Uh, and we're going to look at Genesis 1, 2, and 3 together. And as you know, uh, there are two creation accounts. Uh, the first one, Genesis 1-1, uh, not according to our chapter divisions, but all the way down to 2-3. And then the second creation account begins in, in chapter 2 and verse 4 to the end of uh, the chapter, the second uh, creation account focusing uh, in particular on uh, the creation of Adam and the creation of Eve out of Adam uh, Genesis uh, chapter 1 uh, being uh, m- much more of a generic description uh, of creation. Uh, the climax of the first creation account occurs in verses 26 and 27 uh, with the statement, let us, uh, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let us make man in our image uh, after our likeness. Man created not, 
not ex nihilo, not out of nothing, as the second creation account makes clear. Man is, man is created out of the dust of the ground, so God takes an already existing material to create Adam, and the same with Eve. Uh, he takes already existing material. Uh, so, so there are two types of creation. There's creation out of nothing, and then there's creation which is more artisan, uh, taking material and shaping it and molding it, and, and that seems to be how God created uh, Adam. Uh, notice uh, notice uh, six, seven things very quickly, because uh, we, we, we want to get somewhere else, but we need, we need these seven things very quickly. First of all, that man is created in distinction from the animals. You notice the refrain, uh, let the, uh, verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, uh, and so on. Verse 25, and God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds. So there's order, there's structure in creation, uh, s- species and so on, and, 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 and uh, uh, th- there's, a, there's, a certain, there's a certain compartmentalizing of creation, certain animals and, and birds and so on, uh, belonging to a, a, a set or a group uh, after their kinds. Uh, but then, uh, then in verse 26, a, a different, a different uh, wording. Let the earth bring forth living creatures. Verse 26, let us make man in our image. So the manner in which man is created, the, the agency employed in the creation of man is different. The wording is different. And the result is different. A man is created uh, after the image of God. Uh, and, and that sets man apart from the animals. Now, uh, there is a link, of course. Um, it shouldn't surprise us that there are connections between man, say, and, uh, and the, an, a, an ape or an orangutan or, or, or whatever, uh, created on the same day. Um, God changes the blueprint just a little, just a little. He changes, makes a, just a little change to the blueprint, um, but that change... Uh, is huge in its significance. Uh, so we shouldn't, shouldn't cause us any surprise that there are, uh, there, are, there are genetic markers that identify us with other animals. That shouldn't surprise us at all. I think Genesis 1 is saying that. Uh, but, but there's also a distinction. There's also a separation. Um, and uh, th- that's number one. Number two, uh, man is endowed with capacity and responsibility to rule. And you see that in verse Uh, 26, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds uh, of the air and so on. And then in verse 28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish uh, of the sea and over the birds uh, of the heaven, the so-called dominion mandate. Uh, So man is created distinctly, bearing the image of God, now given responsibility to rule, to govern, to exercise lordship uh, in, in submission to God's lordship, but to exercise lordship over creation. Uh, that sets us apart, of course, from our culture, increasingly putting man and, and everyone else on this planet on the same footing, uh, and that's not how Genesis sees it. Ma- man is here to exercise rule, a moral rule, Responsible rule, loving, caring rule, but rule, uh, and, and, and dominion. Uh, so, so this ordering is a moral and an ethical issue. It's part of the way man, uh, man reflects the image of God. Thirdly, man bears some of the divine uh, attributes. Now, what is this? So God created man in his own image, Uh, Turn to Genesis 5 and the account uh, in chapter 5 and verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, He made man, He made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, He created them, and He blessed them and named them man or Adam in Hebrew, man and Adam, the same word, when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, He fathered a son in His own likeness after His image and named him Seth. So, uh, there you have the use of image again, and in the second use of that word image, 
uh, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness. And, and, and let's take that at face value. Likeness there means that Seth looked like Adam. So a baby is born, and, and, and I've learned over the years to say the baby always looks like the mother. That's always the sort of best way to go, even if I don't think so, even if you think that all babies look the same, essentially. Uh, you always compliment uh, the mother. That's, that's been my sort of fallback position. And, um, <laughs> but in this case, uh, the mother looks, uh, the baby looks like Seth, looks like um, Adam. So when God says he creates man after his image and likeness, there is something about us that reminds us of God. There's something about man that, that, that reflects something of the being of God. Uh, and, um, and, and what is that? Uh, and uh, th that, that uh, is um, uh, a part of that, for example, would be um, intelligence. Part of that would be rationality. Uh, you have the incident in Genesis 2 of man uh, naming the animals, uh, the sort of Dr. Doolittle passage, and, you know, hippopotamus. I don't know what language Adam and Eve were speaking. It wasn't Hebrew. Uh, the languages had not yet been confused, so I don't know what language they actually spoke in the Garden of Eden. But whatever language it was, you know, giraffe, um, naming the animals, in, uh, exercising uh, intelligent um, rule. Uh, Colossians 3, 9 and 10 gives us a little clue as to what the image of God means. We are renewed in a true knowledge after the image of God who created him. We are renewed uh, to a true knowledge. Right? So Paul in Colossians 3 is saying that the image of God is related to knowledge. It's related to uh, rationality and understanding. Number four, God and man are personal. Uh, they are persons. Uh, verse 26 of Genesis 1, God said, let us make man. Let us. What is the us here? Uh, some might argue that this is a reference to the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I, I don't think that's the intent of Moses. Uh, there's no reflection of that in, in Judaism. Judaism was, was essentially uh, uh, monotheistic. There's no hint uh, that anyone in the Old Testament read Genesis 1 and saw, saw Trinity, what they saw uh, was the plurality of majesty. Uh, let us make man was, was a, an indication of majesty. You know, like Queen Victoria would say, we are not amused, but actually she was only talking about herself. Um, and and uh, because she was a monarch uh, and, and reflecting something of uh, majesty. Uh, but no, notice, too, that there is a sense in Genesis 1.26, let us make man, in which God is speaking and communicating. And he's communicating with himself or within himself. Uh, that, that language needs to be refined a little. But there is communication in God. And, and again, uh, that's also true of man, that, that man... man communicates uh, in, a certain, in a certain way, uh, and that communication, uh, that relationship uh, identifies person, uh, personhood. Uh, so so man, man is distinct from the animals. He's endowed with a capacity to rule. Uh, he bears some of the divine attributes, uh, intelligence, for example. Uh, he, he, is, he is created uh, with, as a person, as an entity, uh, distinct from and yet able to communicate with uh, others that doesn't distinguish him necessarily from, from others in creation, from animals who are also able to communicate and so on. Uh, uh, then, um, uh, one, more, uh, if, uh, one more thought here, that life is... Uh, um, Man is created, uh, there's a moral uh, and an ethical and an aesthetic aspect to the creation of um, Adam uh, and Eve. 
Uh, you have this repetition in Genesis of it is good, it is good, and then in verse 31, at the creation of Adam and Eve, and God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. It was very good. Uh, and uh, there, is a, there is an endowment in the creation of Adam and Eve of uh, righteousness and holiness. Uh, another thought here is that life is sacred, uh, that human life is sacred, and you see that especially in Genesis 9. Uh, this is now after the flood, uh, and in verses 5 and 6, uh, the mandate for capital punishment uh, for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it. And from every man, uh, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. Right, so there's a hint uh, there, post-flood, post, uh, post uh, that the image-bearing uh, nature of man also implies a, a, certain, um, a certain sacredness to, uh, to that life. It also implies, by the way, that the image of God is not lost after the fall, and that's important. Genesis 9 assumes, uh, on the, on, as the basis for the argument for capital punishment, uh, that man still retains the image of God. Uh, and one more thought here, just very briefly, in chapter 2 and verse 7, uh, the creation of Adam, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature, a soulish creature. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of garbled talk about what is a soul. Uh, I keep hearing people say things like, uh, man has a soul and animals don't have souls. I have no idea what that means. Uh, there's certainly no basis for it in Genesis. Uh, in Genesis, uh, a soul, simply, soul, to be soulish means to be alive. Uh, and, and in that sense, uh, and, and in that sense uh, there is not discontinuity with the rest of, cre of created life, but actually a sense of continuity with the rest of created uh, life. The distinction lies in the, in the way in which that life comes to be. And, and, and God breathes it, God kisses man. Uh, into existence, uh, and there is a there is a direct sort of consequence in the, in the way that soulishness, that that being alive, uh, comes into being in the case of Adam and Eve. Now, covenant. As we move from that Genesis one and two into Genesis chapter three, uh, and 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 we're going to move into a picture and a scenario in which Adam and Eve are given privileges, and they're given blessings, but they're also given responsibilities. Uh, so, what, what is a covenant? And let's, let's try and come up with a definition of what we mean by a covenant, and one of the most famous definitions of a covenant is a bond in blood sovereignly administered. A bond in blood sovereignly administered. Some of you might have read uh, the writings of Palmer Robertson, for example, and, and once, once you've read his writings, that definition will pop out uh, a great deal. So, a bond in blood sovereignly administered. The problem with that is, and it's the problem, uh, it's, a, it's an important problem, is that there is no blood shedding in the relationship of Adam and Eve in the garden uh, with God. That might lead you, therefore, to conclude uh, that the relationship in the garden is not a a relationship of covenant. And, and that has led folks like John Murray, for example, uh, to refer to the relationship between Adam and God in the Garden of Eden as the Adamic administration rather than uh, a covenantal relationship. I think the problem is exacerbated by too technical a definition. So let, let, me, let me drop down several notches here and give a more general definition of, of what I think a covenant is. And a covenant is a binding relationship involving blessings and obligations. A binding relationship involving blessings and obligations. And if you're still wondering what that is, and you're married, look at your ring on your finger, and that's exactly what it is. It's a binding relationship with blessings and obligations. It's a covenant. Right? So, that's, that's a more generic definition of a covenant, and it's one that I personally uh, would, would adopt. 
Uh, so what we're talking about today, for the rest of today, is that, a binding relationship with blessings and obligations, and obligations. If you're writing this down, don't forget the and obligations, because that issue is going to arise again and again. Are there obligations in the covenant? Is there stuff that I'm actually supposed to do in this covenant uh, relationship? Uh, because of, of uh, sort of phrases like unconditionality, uh, that we're in a relationship of grace that is without conditions. Well, uh, back to the definition, uh, a relationship then a binding relationship involving blessings and obligations. Now, the first use of the term covenant, uh, Genesis 6 and verse 18, Genesis 6 and verse 18, um, behold, I'll, verse 17, I'll bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life unto heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die, verse 18, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark. Right, this is uh, the covenant with Noah. So God is establishing a covenant, and the word covenant occurs. It's the first time it occurs in the Bible. Uh, and, and the term covenant, the Hebrew term covenant, ber, berith, uh, that's the first occurrence. Now, does that mean then that the relationship with Adam was not covenantal because the word doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't um, occur? Uh, and, and for that... You, you have to go to Hosea. Uh, I told you we were, going to be, we were going to be in the Bible today. You have to go to the minor prophet Hosea and to chapter 6 and verse 7, uh, where we read uh, the covenant with Adam. The covenant with Adam. Now, if your version of the Bible doesn't say covenant with Adam, it might say covenant with man something more generic, because the Hebrew word for Adam and man is the same. Adam is, this, is, is the same word for Adam and man. Is, is Hosea referring particularly to a covenant with Adam, or is he just referring generally to a covenant with mankind? Right? The ESV, which is the version I'm reading from here, says uh, that Hebrews 6 and verse 7 uh, says, uh, is a reference to Adam rather than to man generally. In other words, that the relationship between Adam and God in the Garden of Eden was a covenantal relationship. Uh, a, a second point, uh, we're still back now in Genesis 6, 18, I will establish my covenant. The verb to establish in Hebrew means not to inaugurate, but to confirm to confirm something that is already in existence. So when God is entering into a covenant with Noah in Genesis 6, 18, uh, what, what he's actually saying is, I'm going to confirm this covenant relationship that, that I have now with you. In other words, that the relationship already exists. And that implies, so those are the two sort of exegetical reasons why we argue that the relationship with Adam in the Garden of Eden is also a covenantal relationship. Hosea 6-7, uh, covenant with Adam, and the verb to establish in uh, Genesis 6-18. Now, that, 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 that has led us, that data has led us to a point that, 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 that we can now say, Adam and Eve man as male and female, created in the image of God in this particular fashion and description, is now in a covenant relationship in the Garden of Eden. This relationship in the Garden of Eden has blessings and obligations. It has enormous blessings and enormous privileges. The Garden of Eden is not like the rest of creation. The, the rest you know, when God creates something, it's not, it's not necessarily perfect. Now, you have to think about that, right? You can get in trouble if you think about that in the wrong way. But when God creates the world, He doesn't create the world as Eden. Only a little section of it was Eden, paradise. The rest of it was chaos. The rest of it had to be ordered and structured and governed. That might give you a little hint of what heaven might be like. 
but all of it will be paradise. There'll, there'll still be a mandate. Right? There'll, still, there'll still be the obligation to go where no man has gone before. <laughs> right? And to subdue. Um, I hear Star Trek's coming back. 2017, put it on your calendar. Just, it's coming. Um, blessings and, and obligations. There are enormous blessings in the Garden of Eden. They were, they, were allowed, they were allowed to utilize every aspect of the Garden of Eden, eat from every tree uh, in the Garden of Eden except for one. Right? We focus on the one, but don't lose sight of the many here, the enormity of the privileges that Adam and Eve were given in the Garden of Eden. Um, what are the obligations? And there are four of them. N notice, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. After the statement about the image of God, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So here's obligation number one in this relationship that they have with God, the, the obligation of procreation, the, the obligation of marriage and family. Now, it's a blessing, but it's also an obligation. It was something that they had to do. The world wasn't going to be subdued uh, unless, unless they fulfilled this mandate. So, the, so there was a mandate for marriage and children. That's number one. Number two, uh, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. So, so, the, the, so the, the, the mandate for, for labor, um, th there was work to do. The, the subduing and exercising dominion was a, was a mandate for work. It was a mandate for labor. L labor is not a curse. Work isn't a curse. Now, it can feel like a curse because of the lack of productivity, because of the lack of fruitfulness, be because of the sense that post-fall, a lot of work seems to be futile. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't integrate. It doesn't fulfill there's a kind of monotony to it. It doesn't excite. But work in and of itself is part of God's gift and part of God's mandate to man. There'll be work in heaven. You know, we won't be sitting around on, on uh, inflatable, uh, inflatables on, on, uh, on in, in, a, in a swimming pool, you know, with, with, with little fancy drinks with umbrellas. I mean, that's not, that's not heaven. Uh, grape juice with umbrellas, if, if that's where you want to go with this. Uh, but but uh, there'll be work to do. There'll, there'll, be, there'll, be, there'll be dominion to exercise. Uh, so procreation, marriage, family, labor, and then Sabbath, chapter 2 and verse 3. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all His work that He had done in creation. And there's a Sabbath mandate. Adam and Eve were to respect the Sabbath. Not, this is not a post-fall. There's an aspect of Sabbath that is post-fall. There's an aspect of Sabbath that belongs to the ceremonial law of the Old Testament. But the Sabbath here is a creation Sabbath. It belongs to man as man, man as image bearer. Uh, there's, there's a Sabbath principle, a, a principle of, 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 uh, of rest. Uh, and, and, uh, and then in verses uh, 24 and 25, uh, the, the, the mandate for marriage itself is given. Uh, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So you've got, you've got uh, pro well, not in this order, but uh, because I'm, I'm flipping from, from one creation account to another, but so let me, let me, let me do it in reverse order. Uh, there's marriage, there's procreation, there's labor, and there's Sabbath. And those are, those are the blessings and, and obligations. They are blessings, Sabbath is a blessing. It keeps you from the tyranny of work. Right? There's a blessing to work, but there's also a blessing that there's an end to work and there's, and there's rest. Um, so so there, there are these uh, blessings and obligations that are part of this covenantal relationship um, between, uh, between God and man. Now, uh, quickly, uh, let, me, let, me, let me walk through chapter 2. Uh, and I'm going to walk through it very quickly, chapter 2 from verse 4 to the end, and, and this is a bird's eye, 36,000 feet uh, sort of summary of this chapter. What you've got in verses 4 to 6 
is a brief reminder uh, of the earth uh, at the completion of creation, the primor primordial um, world. This is, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, how these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, uh, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, no small plant uh, in the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land, and so on. This primordial uh, world uh, before the creation of uh, Adam and Eve. Then in verses 7 to 9, you've got the creation of Adam as a living soul uh, and, and given, uh, given food. Uh, there were two trees uh, in the Garden of Eden. One was a sacrament and one was a sign. Uh, one was the tree of uh, life and the other uh, was the tree of the knowledge of good and, and evil. One was a sacrament and the other was a test. Uh, and and uh, then in verses 10 through 14, you've got the original relationship between Adam and uh, God. Um, and you've got this perfect environment uh, with uh, rivers uh, and, and rich in resources and so on. Uh, a, a picture of the in, enormous privilege and blessing uh, in this pre-fall um, condition. And then in verses 15 through 17, you've got the responsibilities of this, this relationship. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, in, into this... Uh, into this um, picture of enormous blessing, you've now got this, this contingency uh, upon Adam. Adam has to meet a certain requirement. He has to fulfill a certain obligation. The covenant in Eden was conditional, and it was conditional upon uh, Adam fulfilling the terms that are now placed upon him, that he was not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of uh, good and evil. Now, notice later uh, Eve will succumb to Satan's temptation by making that restriction more restrictive than it actually is. Eve will say, uh, Eve will say that uh, she is not, not only not allowed to eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she's not allowed to touch it. Right? That's not part of God's restriction. Presumably, they could touch the tree, they could climb the tree like Harry and David's pear trees, uh, and you could, you, could, you could smell it, you could, you could handle it, touch it, you just couldn't eat it, to get pedantic about it. So already, uh, Eve is making the commandment of God more restrictive than it actually is. That is, we are hardwired to do that. Right? Whenever we hear a command, we immediately make that command feel and sound more restrictive and more penalizing than it actually is. Right? We are hardwired to do that. There's, a, there's an inbuilt tendency, gravitation towards legalism. And you see it there coming out in Eve uh, in her redefining of the contingent nature of uh, the covenant of works. So what we have here is a principle. Let's back away from this, what we have here in the Garden of Eden is a picture that says, do this and live. Do this and live. They are under probation. They're in, a, they're in a, a, a condition in which it is possible for them to fulfill, and it's possible for them not to fulfill. Uh, it's possible to uh, sin and possible not to sin. Uh, posse peccare, posse non peccare. Possible to sin, possible not to sin. There, there, this is a unique moment in the history of redemption uh, where there is a contingency now in the covenant relationship. God establishes them in covenant, in a relationship with blessings and obligations, and says to them, do this and live. Now, why is this uh, and and I, 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 I think it's fair and appropriate to refer to this relationship as a covenant. 
a covenant of works, a, a covenant that is contingent upon the fulfillment of a certain work on the part of Adam um, and Eve. And in contrast to a covenant of grace. Now, in Genesis 3.15, after the fall, God will, will establish an, another relationship in, in which He will say that the seed of the woman uh, will, will uh, crush the head of Satan. And, and from Genesis 3.15 onwards, we see the emergence of the covenant of grace. So, so what you have in uh, the history of redemption are two covenants. Not one covenant, but two covenants. The covenant of works in the Garden of Eden, and then from the moment of the fall, from Genesis 3.15, the so-called first gospel promise, from Genesis 3.15 onwards, the covenant of grace. So we have a, a, bi, a bi-covenantal relationship, right? a bi-covenantal structure to the Bible. There's the covenant of works, and then there's the covenant of grace. And we're, we're just looking at this minute at the covenant of works. Now, uh, not all Christians and not all Reformed Christians are happy with the expression covenant of works for a variety of reason, reasons. Some because they are unhappy at the thought that in the covenant of works there's no grace. And you've got the covenant of works and then you've got the covenant of grace. There's grace in the covenant of of grace, obviously, but there's no grace in the covenant of, of works. And, and I would say, y- yes, that's true, um, but there are enormous blessings. Grace is God's response to sin. And before there's sin, right, so I, I, I don't want to speak, there's common grace, if you want to be pedantic, there's common grace in the Garden of Eden, but I, I refrain from using the language of grace uh, in the Garden of Eden, because grace is something that is in contrast to sin. And, and as yet, in the Garden of Eden, there is no sin. There's a requirement, there's a contingency, there's the, there's the demand being made for compliance and obedience, and it's done in the form of one particular test, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the test. That's, what, that's, what, uh, that, that's what's established in uh, the Garden of uh, Eden. Uh, what is this saying to us? It is, of course, an explanation in part of how sin enters into the human world. It's not, uh, Genesis 3 is not going to be a description of how sin enters into the world. Sin, there's already sin in the world, in the, in the universe. Satan already exists. Right? So the Bible in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 doesn't tell us how sin enters the universe. The fall of Satan and so on is not part of the picture here. Satan already exists. He comes using the instrumentality of a serpent and causes this serpent to speak as his his sort of voice, the voice of Satan in the talking serpent. And if you have problems with the idea of a talking serpent, you know, you've got Balaam's ass also to contend with uh, a little bit uh, later. Uh, and, and so on. Um, notice that Satan, who uses a, a, a serpent snake to speak in the Garden of Eden by Revelation chapter 12, he's all grown up and he's a fire-breathing red dragon uh, in, in uh, Revelation 12. So, 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 so he too has, has morphed and grown, as it were, in the course uh, of the Bible. Well, we've got the covenant of works. Uh, Some people call it the covenant of creation. Um, Some people call it the covenant of life. Because as a result of this probationary period, what Adam and Eve would have attained, had they been compliant, would have been the confirmation of eternal life. Presumably, they would have been confirmed in their already existing relationship, and, and, and the status of probation would have been removed. I don't understand the creation of Adam and Eve in this way, that they were created to pass the test in order to become children of God. My understanding of Genesis is that they are already children of God 
who are now being given a test. Right? And the status of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is one of sonship. God, they're part of God's family. Uh, and they're being given a probationary test, a probationary test which they fail. The traditional language um, is covenant of works. Uh, and it's the term um, that, that, uh, that, I would, uh, that I would favor. Well, that's a kind of fire hydrant. I'm going to try and keep an eye on the clock, and it's just coming up to 10 o'clock. Um, let me remind you uh, of where we're going. You're, you're going to get a five, six-minute break just to do your stuff and ablutions and whatever else you need to do now and uh, take a breather. Um, but we're going to segue from the covenant of works into the Abrahamic covenant, and we're going to look at Genesis 12, 15, and 17. Now, let me remind you again, we're, we're down in the weeds here, so, so, so let's back up a little. What, what are we talking about? We're talking about God's relationship to man as a covenant relationship, a covenant relationship that is binding and that has blessings and obligations. And what I want us to see is how God continues now in that covenant relationship through the various administrations of redemptive history. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are these, are these entirely distinct separate administrations that have nothing to do with each other, or are they integrally related to each other and cumulative and progressive in their nature? And, and those are, those are Im important concepts. So, so, the big picture is, do we have a, a Bible now that's going to be divided into um, distinct sort of blocks, or do we have a Bible that essentially has one message and one way of salvation, and, and the covenant of works has failed, God, God, God put Adam and Eve in a probationary test in the Garden of Eden, and they failed. Right? They failed. And uh, we, could, we could look at it. We haven't looked at it, but we could look at Genesis 3 and walk through Genesis 3 and describe that failure. But the covenant of works failed. God requires compliance to the law, and man was unable to do it. Now, is the principle of compliance to the law, is the principle of the covenant of works no longer in operation? And just think, just think of Jesus and the rich young ruler. Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what does Jesus say? Obey the law. He takes him to the Ten Commandments. How many marks out of ten would you give Jesus as an evangelist? You've got a rich young man coming up and saying to you, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Every church needs rich young men. Right? This church, when it was looking for a roof, needed rich young men. Right? You don't want this fish to go away. So what's the answer? What must I do to be saved? Obey the law. How many marks out of ten would you give Jesus as an evangelist? Right? There are evangelists in our country who would have got that rich young man into the kingdom in a heartbeat. Right? Pray the sinner's prayer, and you're, and you're in. And Jesus says to him, go sell all that you have and give to the poor. And he allowed that rich young man to go away. What's going on in that passage? Well, there are lots of things going on. First of all, this young man has no concept of sin. Absolutely no concept of sin. You, you, you cannot understand the gospel unless you understand sin. You, you can't understand the solution unless you know what the problem is. This man doesn't know what the problem is. But also, in principle, he's saying to this rich young man, if you think, you know, all these things I've, I've obeyed since my youth up, if you think that you can obey the covenant of works, go ahead and do it. Right? It's a hypothetical statement on the part of Jesus to the rich young man that the covenant of works hypothetically is still in operation. If you can obey, the, if you can obey God's law, there's nothing that can keep you out of heaven. But there's only one who can keep God's law, and that's Jesus. But it also gives us a little clue to understand the work of Jesus in terms of he's the one who fulfilled the covenant of works. 
He is the last Adam. Right? He's the second man, to use the language of 1 Corinthians 15, who obeyed the covenant of works. Okay, time up, break. We'll come back to uh, the Abrahamic covenant in a second.